Good morning. Welcome to Gospel of Grace. Especially welcome those who are here for the first time, or maybe this is uh, your second time. We are glad that you're here. Um, our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 14, but before we turn there, there's a couple announcements um, that I'd like to point out to you. Some of them are in the bulletin. Uh, some I'll just uh, make mention um, <clears throat> before I read the call to worship. Uh, as you may know, our last uh, marriage seminar was uh, postponed. Um, um, we couldn't reserve next week's um, Friday, so it'll be, um, it'll be on the 22nd of this month, so just keep that in mind. That'll be for the last uh, marriage seminar. Uh, also, um, as some of you may know, um, Brad Cornwell um, is in the hospital. He's doing better, uh, but we just ask that you would continue praying for him, for his recovery, um, pray for his family, uh, that God would just grant him uh, strength and grace to recover from um, from what he had. Also, we prayed last week for Chloe Klopot. Um, the surgery went well. Uh, she's home with her family. We just asked that she would continue praying for her as well, that she would recover from the procedure that she had. Um, as I said, call of worship is found in Psalm 14. I ask you to stand with me as we read Psalm 14. <clears throat> the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have com uh, committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know, who eat up my people as they eat bread, do not, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion, where the, when the Lord restores his captive people. Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be glad. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us this morning to this place where we can worship you. We thank you that you have called us out of this world, we, that you have called us your people, that you have given us the knowledge of the truth, that you have uh, called us uh, to yourself, Lord, and we just thank you for that. And we ask that today that you would bless us as we worship you, that this uh, worship service would be a pleasing aroma of sacrifice to you, and that this would edify us, that this, was, this would draw us closer to you, Lord. And if there are any here today who have yet to know you, Lord, we ask that today would be their day of salvation, that you would call them to yourself. We ask that you would bless every single person here, every aspect of the service that would be a blessing to us. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning, church. Since we've launched in 2017, we've read from Romans to Revelation twice, and then this third time we started at Matthew, and we're reading again consecutively through the New Testament. And today we have the privilege of completing the Gospel of Mark. So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and we'll read from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them, while they were walking along on their way to the country, they went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward. Let's pray. Our great God, your people have gathered together today on this Lord's Day. And we've come here to acknowledge you, our Heavenly Father. You are holy. You are righteous. You are just. And you are merciful. Father, you are loving in the evidence of creation. In the fact that you are the provider and the sustainer and and the keeper. Jesus, we acknowledge you as the eternal Son of God. But we also acknowledge that you are our Redeemer. And that you are our Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you as one essence with the Godhead. And the third person of the Trinity. And you are our comforter, you are our teacher, and you are our guide. Reading this passage, we again are reminded of your plan to save mankind. We acknowledge that we have sinned. We are born as sinners. We have all fallen short of your glory. We deserve eternal damnation because we violated your holy standards. And yet, it was in your perfect plan to save mankind by Jesus, you being made a man, coming into this world through the miraculous incarnation. You left heaven and you entered this sinful world as a babe. You became not only a man, but a servant of man. You lived a perfect life always being obedient to the Father, always being led by the Holy Spirit, always fulfilling the whole law, always being a perfect example of what man was supposed to be. God, it was in your plan for Jesus to die for us. Because he lived a perfect life, Jesus, you, you took upon yourself our sins, And the Father punished you as he was supposed to punish us. We deserve that separation from love and mercy and kindness. We deserve the pain of suffering. But Jesus, you bore that on the cross for us. You died for those who would believe in you. It was also in your plan, as we read today, For you, Jesus, to be resurrected and to walk this earth for another 40 days. Death could not contain you. The tomb could not keep you. You resurrected and you proved that your sacrifice was accepted by the Father. You said that you have the right and the ability to give your life and then to to take it up on, on again. It was in your power. It was in your will. And you came back to life to prove to us that your sacrifice was accepted. And also that physical death is not the end. There is an eternity that awaits us. And after ascension, uh, after, after resurrection, you ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. To intercede, to mediate 
between those who believed in you and the Father. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for our redemption. Also, we are reminded today with the many witnesses who saw you, who were willing to die for you. They saw your resurrection, and they, their testimony is left in Scripture, in your word. And your word is the truth. Your word is the authority. And we believe your word. But we also see even in our text that there are some who don't believe. And we come before you, Lord, and we ask that you would be merciful and that you would open the blind eyes, that you would shatter the hearts of stone and give hearts of flesh to those who are perishing, those who reject you as Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for our children, children who may have heard the gospel, but yet who live as though everything depends on them and that they are their Lord of their whole life of the universe and they just want to fulfill their fleshly pleasures. We pray that you would please convert them, draw them to Christ, stop them in their sin. We also pray for siblings or brothers and sisters who are not walking with you, who are living a life of sinful pleasure. We ask that you would draw them to Christ. May you open their eyes to see the weight of their sin and that the wages of sin is death, eternal death in the lake of fire. We pray for our parents, those who doubt, those who make up reasons why they don't believe. Lord, convert them and draw them to Christ. May they humbly submit to Jesus as Lord of their lives. And we pray for our extended family, our cousins and nephews and uncles and aunts, grandparents. We, we pray for, for those who, who are not walking with you. May you draw them to yourself. And we also pray for our neighbors who live beside us, who see us. Lord, I know that there are some here in our service who don't believe. You know their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would today draw them to Christ. May today be the day of their salvation. Lord, we also are thankful. Thankful that you are our God. That you're all-powerful, all-knowing. That you're present everywhere at the same time, that you see everything, that you know everything, that you hold everything. And we thank you for our life, even though we know that our life is very uh, short-term here on this earth, and then we have eternity. But we also pray for our church, pray for the fellow believers that you brought together uh, into this one body where we could encourage one another, love one another, Build up one another, serve one another, and worship you together. We thank you for this building that we're able to meet at. We thank you for the church building that we're building. I pray that you would bless that whole process and that it would be dedicated to you and your glory. Lord, we thank you for our country. We thank you for the elections that happened this week. We trust that. You are having mercy on this country, and we ask that you would please allow the government, those who are in charge, to implement laws that would be favorable to the church, to your people, so we could worship you in peace, without any persecution. Lord, we desire to honor you in our lives. And today we are reminded again through your word about our duty you have called us to go and evangelize the lost, to spread the good news of the gospel, to give our testimony to those who are perishing, to confirm to them that, that after our physical life, there's an eternity either with you in heaven or in hell. 
Lord, use us as vessels. Draw people to yourself through us. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to work in us so we could live our whole lives as holy, as, as righteous lives, being obedient to your word, being faithful to you. Lord, forgive us for our sins. We, we confess that we have done things that displease you. And we haven't done the things that you, you wanted us to do. We confess our sins. We desire to turn away from them. And, and we ask that you would help us with that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you said that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and you will forgive those who confess their sins. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we do pray for the sermon that we are about to hear. Pray that you would bless Brother Paul as he comes and, and reads your word and expounds on it. Uh, pray that you would allow him to remember everything that he studied, that he would be able to communicate it clearly. And I pray for your people. I pray for everyone here that we would be uh, not only listeners or hearers, but that we would be doers. So help us to implement your word into our lives. May it conform us more to the image of your Son, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we also pray for the offering that we're about to have. We acknowledge that all good things that we have are from your gracious hand. And so as an act of worship, we desire to give back to you. We trust that these funds will be used for your glory. We ask that you would give wisdom to the elders, unity, and how to best implement these funds. Lord, we just ask that gospel of grace church would remain to be faithful to you may we grow in our fear knowledge and love of you and we pray all these things in christ's name amen
You may be seated. family. It is a blessing to be with you all this morning, and we also extend a warm welcome to any visitors we might have. Um, thank you for joining us, and we pray that uh, you'll be ministered, and uh, in any way we can minister to you, and uh, we can have some time to, to talk afterwards. Before we read the passage of Scripture at hand, um, I wanted us just to think of kind of daily interactions we have among people, um, and oftentimes you've, you've probably noticed it, I know, I've noticed it, just talking to people. Um, sometimes you could just bring up a, you know, kind of a generic topic, and oftentimes you'll find many different opinions people have, right? Bring up politics, people have opinions. Bring up sports, there's opinions. 
you know, all sorts of things, education, you know, work, there's opinions about this, opinions about that. Um, and again, people are willing to provide their opinion. Oftentimes, um, they feel like their opinion matters. Um, they, they feel like they have some insight or maybe even wisdom on expressing their viewpoint and their opinion. Um, and although they might not be subject matters at, at the subject at hand, again, they still think that, um, you know, they, they can provide good insight or, or maybe they could even provide good um, uh, information for an argument to, to defend something or to present something, to prove something that they are correct. Now, on the flip side, when you think about it, where um, most people are not quick to apologize. They might be quick to give you an opinion, but whenever someone's wrong, it's, it's, it's usually not quick to apologize and admit that they were wrong or to say that, yeah, sorry, I, I, you know, that wasn't correct, what I said. Um, and most people would consider themselves to be smart. Um, and, and maybe they might not call themselves wise, uh, but most people also would not call themselves a fool if that's the opposite of being wise. Uh, yet when we think about our own life, we've all done something foolish in our lives, but yet we choose not to identify as a fool, which is, I think, just human nature. In today's passage, we will be confronted with the question of are we wise? Um, and as you remember, um, when we were looking through James and letter of James, uh, James provides a series of tests throughout his letter to verify the authenticity of a believer. Uh, throughout his letter, he's, there are several subjects he's discussed, but he's talked about how do you react to trials? How do you react to God's word? Do, do you have partiality in your life? Do you have real, genuine, saving faith that is supported by works? Has your speech been transformed? And today's test and question, is your wisdom from above? Now this test is aimed to guide us to understand what is wisdom from above and how does it manifest itself in our lives? So let's turn to James chapter 3. I'll be reading from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. James 3 from verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good conduct his works in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not coming down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruits, without doubting, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we'll be going kind of verse by verse to see and understand what is James trying to tell his listeners, what is James trying to tell us today? Now he opens with the question, who among you is wise and understanding? Uh, now wisdom in general for, for the Greeks, it, it was more theory-based. It, it was more knowledge-based. It was them theorizing and, and doing all sorts of mental gymnastics to try to understand, to try to answer questions. Uh, but for Hebrews, uh, the word wisdom, it, it was more understood that it is knowledge applied. Knowledge applied. It's the information that they have applied in their everyday life. 
It is how they would live their life that really uh, would dictate whether they have godly wisdom or not. And although one might think that um, the word understanding is, is very similar to, to wisdom and knowledge, and use, but it is a little bit different. In the Greek, uh, ver, excuse me, in the Greek reference, it, it meant to, uh, to be a specialist or, or a professional, uh, one who's highly skilled in a specific topic. So that is one who has understanding. Uh, so in essence, what James is saying, um, who among you is able to live wisely? Who is able to apply knowledge in their everyday life? Uh, who is a specialist in their life? Who is that wise professional? Who is able to apply knowledge correctly? So that's kind of what James is, is asking. Um, those that claim to be wise, that there should be evidence of this in their life. So James is saying, the works will testify of wisdom, and it will be supported by good and proper conduct. Uh, if you remember, in a similar way, James was questioning those that say they have faith, but have no works to support their faith. James 2.20, where it says, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless or, or dead? So in a similar way, James is trying to point out, like, just as faith that it can, it cannot be, um, does not show evidence of the good works, it's dead, it's useless. In a similar way, if you're saying you are wise, but your works and actions and conduct do not support it, well, then that's not correct. So a real saving faith is backed by works. In a similar way, proper wisdom, godly wisdom, is also backed by proper conduct. Uh, here James describes it as good conduct. Uh, good, in, in the sense he's meaning that it's lovely, it's something beautiful, attractive. It, it's noble. It's an excellent lifestyle. Uh, actions that are attractive. Uh, something to be admired. So he's saying it would be supported by that type of conduct, good conduct. So real godly wisdom and the application of the wisdom is supported by one's own deeds and actions in life. So it's not just a theory-based understanding of, hey, this is what I read, I'm, I'm comprehending it, but it's also something that is put into action in one's life. So not only is it supported by one's works, not only is it something that is actually seen by others, but it also is an inward attitude of the heart. Look what he says at the end of verse 13. Shown by his good conduct, his works, in the gentleness of wisdom, the gentleness of wisdom. Uh, the Greek word for gentleness is also translated as meek, praos. It means the opposite of self-promotion, the opposite of self-ambition, the opposite of arrogance. This was used to describe Jesus in uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Gentle and humble in heart. This word was also used by Jesus to describe those who are blessed. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the lowly or gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Again, it's a gentleness and to be done in gentleness of wisdom. In the Greek, where, where, when this was re, word was referring to people, it meant gracious or, or someone that is mild. In noun form, it was used of a horse that was broken, meaning you could ride it. It was no longer wild and untamed. Uh, they, they would describe it as power under control. Power under control. 
So James is saying, you who are saying that you are wise, not only will your outward conduct support this claim, but your inward motivation for your actions is to be done in gentleness of wisdom, is to be done under control. See, wisdom from above is not boastful or proud or arrogant. Uh, that wisdom is not to be used uh, to show how much smarter one is. Not to be used to just, just to prove a point. Uh, just to win an argument. No, it is lowly. Accompanied with humility. Gentleness. So James sets this test of true wisdom as a two-part test. One, it's talking about the outward conduct, things that we do in our everyday life, visible by others, how we interact, and also the inward motivation. The inward motivation. Now, these two are linked together. They're, they're not to be separated. They are linked to better, together. Both describe wisdom that is from above. Both of these matters, our conduct and our own motivation for the conduct, are really matters of the heart. They're matters of the heart. Luke 6.45, it is stated this way. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from the abundance of his heart. So, so really what is revealed, it comes out in our conduct, is what is stored up inside the heart. Now, if one has not received a new heart by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to his word, there's evil in the heart. That heart is tainted by evil. The thoughts are tainted by evil. The words are evil. The conduct is evil. The motivations are evil. We know that only God is good. And he is the only one who can give a new heart and cleanse the mind from all unrighteousness. Everything that is foolish. Now James continue, continues to show us what does and does not accompany godly wisdom. Look at, back at uh, verse 14. He says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. He calls it bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Uh, the word bitter really meant like undrinkable water. It wasn't pleasant, not meant to be consumed. Now, jealousy, I think we, we know and understand, it's, it's wanting something or someone that someone else has. It doesn't belong to us. But one is ruled by it. It's not just, just being jealous in a sense where it's a little bit, but the, the way James calls it bitter, it, it's to the point of making yourself bitter. Jealousy accompanied with resentment and possibly anger. Now, this could be directed at people, being jealous towards other people. But in reality, in all honesty, it is directed towards God. Some might have the question is, why was I born in this family? Why not a richer family? Why am I not a little taller or a little stronger or faster? Whatever the case may be. Oftentimes, that's what people do, blaming God. And it's not just being envious, but there's also selfish ambition, which is translated as contention or, or strife, um, a, a rivalry, trying to outmaneuver others for your own gain. Turn to me to Philippians Chapter 2, verse 3 and 4.
Paul's saying, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This is the opposite of what James is saying. This is the opposite of self-promotion, self-gratification. So James is saying if that's there, if that's there, it really shows that there is evil in the heart. Because your life is consumed about you. What is best for me? And interesting how James points out that this is in your heart. This is the pattern of an unregenerated heart. So if this is in your heart, you are full of pride and you're arrogant. And in essence, you are lying to yourself and lying against truth. In essence, you say you're wise, but this is in your heart. You are self-deceived. You think you have wisdom and understanding, but your heart is full of bitter jealousy and self admission yet you think you are so smart. I will tell you, you are delusional. You are standing in contrast to what true godly wisdom is. And you've actually totally misunderstood the origins of your so-called wisdom wisdom that you have. Speaking of origin, James continues verse 15. This wisdom is not coming down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. So he's very straightforward. He's saying this wisdom is not from God. Earthly. It, it's, not, it's not from heaven. Uh, it talks about natural. It's referring to unspiritual. Um, Jude uses a similar word. Um, Jude 19 he says, These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, not having the spirit. That's what he, he's referring to natural, devoid of the spirit. Um, you could say this is man-made wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Read it. But a natural man does not accept the depths of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually examined. Again, this is a person who does not have the Spirit. Man-made wisdom. James even goes further and calls it demonic. And really, if it is not of God, it is of Satan. So this is the opposite of godly wisdom. This is not wisdom from above. And the way God calls it, he calls this wisdom actually foolish. Look again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read from verse 20 and 21. Paul writes, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God calls that wisdom foolishness. Foolishness. Now also consider the result of this ungodly wisdom. Back in James chapter 4, he says, For where jealousy, verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, 
there is disorder and every evil practice. Now, again, he's repeating jealousy and selfish ambition. The sense is like that was the problem amongst that community. James is like reiterating like, look, this is wrong. And the outcome, he's saying, is disorder and every evil practice. Meaning there, there is no order. Instead, there is confusion. And, and why would there be confusion? Well, because God made everything orderly. But this demonic made ba- man-made wisdom, it stands in opposition to God's order and rules. It is exactly opposed to the way God had created things. Paul, in Romans, describes the folly of man-made wisdom. Turn with me to Romans, chapter 1. Read from verse 18, 18 to 32. Romans 1, from verse 18, just follow along and think about What has happened that has made man so foolish? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... Both his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. For their females exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, also the males abandoned the natural function of the female and burned in their desire toward one another. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit mind to do those things which are not proper, having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the righteous requirement of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So having seen the evidence of God through his creation, they did not glorify him as God. They thought they were wise, but in God's eyes they were fools. They believe Satan's lies rather than God's truth. So then they were controlled by their lust, by sin, jealousy, selfish ambition. People often ask, why is there no peace on earth? It is because of sin, because of what we just read. Man's rejection of the wisdom of God. Man's rejection of everything holy and good. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
Man is to acknowledge who God is, the holy and powerful God. Man is to submit to God. And God is the source of wisdom and knowledge. He is the giver of that wisdom. But an unregenerated heart does what is right in their own eyes. Because the heart is ensnared to sin. The heart is in bondage of sin. The whole being is corrupted. The whole person is corrupted. Even though they think or desire to do something good that they think is good, the motivations are corrupted. So, not only is there disorder, as James says, but also every evil practice. Or it could be translated as every worthless work. Whatever those actions, they're, they're actually good for nothing. There's no profit in their actions. Uh, they're like chaff to be thrown out and burned. This is what worldly man-made wisdom is. And this is the wisdom that leads to death and destruction. Because the source of that wisdom is not God. So having seen what ungodly wisdom, wisdom not from above, uh, what that looks like and how it affects the heart, how it is not supported by righteous deeds. Now let's consider wisdom from above. Wisdom that comes from God. It's not man-centered wisdom. It is something free from jealousy, free from selfish ambitions, arrogance, and lies. This wisdom permeates the whole life of a believer. The evidence of this wisdom is seen in the conduct of this person. And this wisdom deals with the inner matters of the heart. In contrast to the earthly man-centered demonic wisdom, James points to the source of this wisdom, verse 17, saying, but the wisdom from Above. The wisdom from above. Paul was adamant to mention that in his teachings and, and in his words, they're not to be based on man's wisdom, but God's. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 8. Listen to the way Paul describes his writings and the purpose of them. He says, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superiority of word or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the witness of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my word and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, and of power, so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are being abolished. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The wisdom which has been hidden, which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Think, wow. Paul wanted to be certain that his readers, us today, would know that his writings, his teachings, were not just based on his wisdom, his intellect, his learnedness. Everything he studied, no, they are to be based 
on the wisdom of God. The wisdom from above. God's eternal and powerful wisdom. With that wisdom, the whole world was created. And by it, the plan of salvation was revealed and executed exactly as God willed. That is the power of the wisdom of God. So our faith does not rest in man's wisdom. Our faith rests in the power of God and not man. And we're thankful for that. May it never be that we as believers believe any teaching of man that is contrary to the word of God. May it never be that we believe anything that is contrary to the word of God because that would be a lie against God's word. And we are to seek and ask for wisdom. Proverbs is full of examples of how wisdom is to be cherished, uh, how it should be sought after. It should be regarded as more precious than gold or diamonds or anything else in this world. It's to be sought. James himself uh, says in James 1.5, says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So we are to ask and seek God's wisdom. Now, having seen the source of this new wisdom coming from above, Continuing, verse 17, let us see how it is defined. Wisdom from above, how is it defined? Read it again. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruits, without doubting, without hypocrisy. So as we're reading this, also just again consider how this wisdom is to impact our lives, our everyday life as we live here in this earth, and how it impacts our heart. First is to be pure, to be free from defilement, in a sense of spiritual integrity. It really points to holiness. And I believe that is why he mentions it first. Because God is holy. His wisdom is pure and holy. It's not defiled by the sinfulness of this world because it is not of this world. It says it is to be peaceable. Peace-loving or pursuing and promoting peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. The, the opposite of one who creates disorder, but a peacemaker. This wisdom from above is considerate. Also be translated as gentle or courteous. Uh, this is one who is thinking of others and not just himself. Uh, the opposite of self-ambition or strife. Considerate. This wisdom is submissive, also translated as reasonable, or open to reason, uh, being compliant and agreeable with the will of God. It's not trying to fight against the law and rule of God. It is to be teachable, and not stubborn, not set in your own ways, but accepting the word of God for it to affect your life. It is full of mercy, or you could say controlled by mercy, uh, concern for others, uh, ability also to forgive. Jesus said, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. To be quick to forgive and to show grace. 
This wisdom's full of mercy. This wisdom's full of good fruits. Uh, our everyday life is to exhibit the good fruit. Uh, something that is good and wholesome and nourishing. It's living life with a purpose. Glorifying God and serving others. Full of good fruits. It is without doubting. Or you could say unwavering, impartial. Uh, it has decisiveness to it. Uh, not being wishy-washy, but to be consistent. Paul describes it in this way, Colossians uh, chapter 2, 7 and 8. It says, having been firmly rooted and being built up in him... And having been established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and abounding with thanksgiving, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So without doubting, it's to be firmly rooted and being built up in Him, in Christ. Imagine the tree having good, firm roots that if there's any kind of wind, it's standing strong because it is rooted deep in Christ, rooted in truth, rooted in wisdom. So whenever any form of other doctrine, when the wind blows, it's not toppled over. It's standing firm and strong. James says it's also without hypocrisy. Talking about being sincere, not putting on a religious mask for Sunday morning, not pretending or hiding, but being open and genuine of who you are. As someone has said, faith is living without scheming. Faith is living without scheming. We are to be without hypocrisy. So this wisdom from above, it, it permeates the whole person. It dictates the way we act, what our motiv motivations are, how we think, what we prioritize in life. It dictates what do I desire? What do I strive for in my life, in my everyday life? What is the meaning and purpose of my life? This wisdom banishes falsehoods. It exalts the holy God. And it drives out jealousy and self-ambition and arrogance away. This wisdom is rooted in the truth of God's word and is able to stand against all falsehoods of Satan. And the Lord provides this wisdom to those who call upon his name and ask for it. So with this knowledge, I desire to ask you that question, are you wise? Are you wise in the wisdom from above? Or do you think you're wise from the wisdom of this world? Does your conduct support godly wisdom? Is there evidence to show godly wisdom? I hope we're all honest with ourselves. And I hope we're not self-deceiving ourselves. And if you don't have godly wisdom, turn to Christ and ask him for it. For you to be wise unto salvation. For your heart to be filled with the wisdom of God. Now, James concludes this section with showing the outcome of wisdom from above. Turn back to James 3, verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. 
Unlike the earthly man-made wisdom where disorder abounds and all kinds of evil is present, wisdom from above bears a fruit of righteousness. It can also be translated as a harvest of righteousness. By living our lives in the wisdom from above and having our lives conform to his will, we are proclaiming the peace of God to this world. Through our actions, we're proclaiming the power of the gospel in our own lives, of a changed heart that only God can do. That is the power of the gospel to change people's lives, to change people's heart. And the life of the believer is to bear that fruit, the fruit of righteousness, which is not only a blessing to us as believers, but it is actually a blessing to others as well. Christ said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. A believer's satisfaction is Christ. Nothing else can come close in this world. And the outcome of sowing righteousness, which is done in the Spirit, is also described uh, this way in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, 10. Galatians chapter 6, from verse 7 to 10. Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And he says, Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of the faith. So what is sown in the Spirit reaps eternal life. The, op the opposite, sown in the flesh, is corruption. But to believers, Paul says, don't lose heart in doing good. Use whatever opportunity you have to do good. Continue to sow in the Spirit. Continue to live for Christ. Living out the gospel message in your life. May our conduct today affirm that we possess wisdom from above. May we continue to affirm the gentleness of this wisdom. Continue to affirm that you are free from jealousy, arrogance, and self-ambition. And even if you have fallen in that sin as a believer, repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness. And ask Him to continue to provide His wisdom for you for every day in your life. God is gracious and good towards us. May we seek to honor Him in our lives every day, pursuing Him living a godly life and ex expressing the wisdom of God through our actions in our life as evidence of a changed heart because that is what Christ has done in us. And it's a wonderful and joyful thing. I invite you to stand as we conclude in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your love towards us this morning. Thank you for the privilege to, to be here with your saints and to read about 
godly wisdom, wisdom that you send. Our hearts are full of joy as we just desire to honor you for who you are, a loving God, a caring God. Forgive us where we have not been walking truthfully or honestly before you. May we set aside anything that hinders our spiritual walk and our growth and our maturity to love you more and desire to know you more so that we can be obedient to you and glorify your name. I pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Bow with me as we're dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the all-wise God. And we thank you that you have revealed yourself and that you have given us your wisdom through your word. And that because of Christ, we can know you and be wise to walk in obedience and uh, love for you. And I pray that as we leave here this morning, that you would guide us this week that we would be mindful of our obedience, we'd be mindful of the way that we walk, that we would desire to walk in wisdom and uh, be light to those that don't know you. 
It's in your name that we pray. Amen.